Synesthesia is this experience intensified. In the art of the relational body, from mere touch to the virtual body, Masumi writes, Synesthetes do not add a deviation from the normal path of development. They just prune the same developmental path less fully. The feeling width of the world is never experienced consciously in all of its fullness. A certain parsing or pruning, in Masumi's terms, is always necessary in order to subtract from the welter and distinguish one sensation or perception from another. This is not detrimental to experience. Experience grows from the cuts that propel it in new directions. To parse is absolutely necessary. The question is, as Masumi also asks, what kind of parsing is at stake and under what conditions? When Mukhopadhyay writes, I may select a fraction of the environment, say, that shadow of a chair or that door hinge over there, and grow my opinions and ideas around it, he is composing with a wealth of potential and perception to extract its most lively expression. Poetry comes to Mukhopadhyay from this kind of pruning. Quote, this creates a defense system for my overstimulated visual sense organ. Maybe poetry happens to grow around those things. End quote. In Clark's clamor, the parsing tunes to the crack. Quote, I can be too eager to listen. The scar here on my thumb is a gift from a cracked bowl that begged to be broken. Cracked bowls feel their way into the urgency of a touch. The touching here evoked is of two tonalities. It is both the touching of the hands-on feeling of the world and the incipient touch the world calls forth. It is both the being in the world of feeling and the feeling with of the world emerging. In Mukhopadhyay, we hear this through the personification of the oxygen, a personification which is not a making human of the oxygen, but a more than human becoming oxygen. What is foregrounded are the molecules struggling to counter their disappearance, the effects of this disappearance on the environment and on those who most need it, i.e. the humans. All at once, each level of experience overlaps, the incipiency of one affecting the coming into actualization of the other. If mere touch synesthesia or sight touch synesthesia is about feeling with, these are two examples of it, it seems to me, neither of which directly require either touch or vision, or sorry, either hearing or vision. Why call this mere touch synesthesia, then? With Masumi, I would, argue, I would agree that the nomenclature is deeply misleading. Building on research on mere neurons, neurons that fire when an action is observed, the problem with mere touch synesthesia is that it seems incapable of imagining a world that begins with a feeling with, a world that begins in the relational middle. As such, it carries the same implied bias of much work on mere neurons, quote, that our perception is fundamentally a passive reception of an image constituting a private representation of the world, which under normal conditions is then cognitively corrected to purify it of illusions of perspective and other unthinking errors, Masumi. In addition, the assumption that we ever perceive along single sensory routes is deeply erroneous. Senses are felt on a continuum in an amodal register. The world is experienced across registers of sensation that bathe our bodies in a complexity, a co-composition of world bodying that changes the environment and the bodies composed by it at every turn. John Lee Clark proposes the concept of distantism to speak to the tendencies at the heart of these assumptions. For Clark, distantism promotes the impossibility of a deafblind feeling with the world. In, in this limit case of distantism, a lived experience of feeling felt is denied. Quote, researching our community's history, I see that we have always been tactile, but hearing and sighted people have always attempted to keep our tactile hoods in check. We've always been denied access to some of the most basic human rights. What should we call this force of, supp of suppression? I propose we call it distantism. There is no distantism in the relational body. 
That is to say, distantism is not a quality of bodying. Bodying is never parsable from the world with which it co-composes. Perception is always already with the world in its unfolding. This withness can never be articulated in its fullness, but the feeling of it remains with us nonetheless. It is this feeling that moves in the lines of Clark and Mukhopadhyay's poetry, in the rhythm of the more than saying their feeling with makes felt. Distantism is not how we perceive. It is how perception is imposed on us. It is how experience is made intelligible by baseline beliefs about the homogeneity of experience neurotypically parsed. In the mid-2000s, a group of deafblind activists began to invent and share a mode of communication that would allow them to take back control over their own complex fields of sensation and to collectively invent new ones. The hope, as Clark articulates it, was to be able to move from a distantist engagement with touch to a metatactile one. He writes, A response I often get when I interact with people is how did I know that their shoulder needed a massage, or that they were hungry or sad, or a spot on their arm was itchy. The owners of pets I meet are also amazed. Almost immediately, I found their pet's sweet spots. That's right, she loves that. But how did you know? I wasn't conscious of it. It was natural, so natural, in fact, that I didn't have a name for it. This skill that goes beyond just feeling texture, heft, shape, and temperature. I'd like to call it metatactile knowledge. This skill that goes beyond just feeling texture, heft, shape, and temperature sounds a lot like the feeling with Mukhopadhyay describes as the feeling being of oxygen in the miner's space. For the becoming ox oxygen of the more than, of the more than human, is the way Mukhopadhyay enters into the touching of the environment. It is how he feels with the texture, heft, shape, and temperature of that singular ecology. A modality that moves beyond but includes the hands-on gesture of touch. Metatactile knowledge is the act of reaching toward experience, allowing all composing all co-composing bodily senses, including the kinesthetic, the proprioceptive, the vestibular, to connect to the incipiencies of a welling environment. Encouraging the welling environment to, quote, grow around him, as Mukhpadai might say, en enables the necessary parsing while facilitating the richest possible experience of sensation or feeling with. When Clark speaks of the bowl asking to be touched, he is resisting giving touch a primarily human inflection. To sense for him is to feel with in the sense Whitehead gives to feeling, to be affected by it. This is metatactile sensing, to connect to the quality of an encounter as much as to the actual shape of the surface with which one comes into contact, to feel with the encounter coming into contact with the complexity of relations that it, that encounter calls forth. Clark suggests that metatactile knowledge is a protactile form of touch, or mode of touch. The protactile movement celebrates the metatactile. It honors all kinds of tactility, including, I would hazard, the shaping of experience through the force of the relational or virtual body. Foregrounding the importance for communication of a direct perception of relation, Protactile encourages deafblind people and anyone who communicates with them to engage in continuous physical touch. This continual contact, they argue, allows them to finally become autonomous in their communication by being more attuned to the nuances of the non-linguistic aspects of communication. Bringing out the full potential of tactile American Sign Language and allowing, as becomes necessary, for for tactile American Sign Language to depart from the habits of visual American Sign Language, which remains the mother tongue of many in the deafblind community, protactile is as much a linguistic as a cultural movement. Claiming experience according to their own complex registers of sense, protactile teachers and students emphasize that it's high time for the deafblind to be teaching the deafblind. As Christine Rochart describes it, protactile broadens the spectrum of communication of the deafblind outside of the standard tactile with American or any other international sign language and several other manual methods. So I just want to be clear here that protactile also invents beyond the